You're listening to Blue Collar CEO, the podcast that's all about helping you build a better, more profitable, and more sustainable home service business. Each week, we'll cover a different topic that will help enable your company to move forward to success. And here's your host, Ryan Redding. What is up, Blue Collar CEOs? It's Ryan. It is great to be with you today. I uh, am going to, I like, I'm just going to shut up because I can't wait to get you into this conversation. I'm going to introduce you to Drew Roberts. If you don't know Drew, Drew is with ProSource. They're a distributor uh, of plumbing parts based in like upstate South Carolina. Uh, they do, uh, they're a larger organization, but one of the things that's really important to him is servant leadership. This guy was a C student in college. He had no idea what he wanted to do. He was fortunate to land in the distribution industry. And then 20 years later, here he is as CEO. Uh, he uh, has a lot of insight on the values that are important to him as a servant leader and developing those things within the organization. We talk about a lot of topics and have some really good book recommendations I'm going to put in the show notes. Uh, but I'm going to shut up because this guy is fascinating to talk to. Let me introduce you to Drew. Drew, I am really looking forward to uh, the conversation with you today. Um, and but before we get going, I guess let's just start. I, I think I don't think a lot of people might know who you are yet, at least by name. But let's start there. Who are you? What do you do? So I'm Drew Roberts. I'm the CEO of ProSource. We're a wholesale plumbing and electrical distributor based in Greenville, South Carolina. And currently, right now, we have nine locations serving the uh, the East Coast. Serving the East Coast, and for, and we were talking before we started hitting record. Like Greenville, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful parts of the United States. Like it's just great downtown. They've done a great job, like revitalizing that area. It's a, it's an awesome spot to be. Totally jealous that you are there and I'm not. Yeah, we're very fortunate to be here. You know, it's great way. It's a great place to raise the family. Um, I'm a big history buff, so being on the West Coast and being able to get to all these historical areas in, you know, Colonial Williamsburg and. Uh, so super, super fortunate to live here. And uh, I'm not jealous of you in Tulsa. Um, I'd be the first to say that, but uh, we're very good. We're lucky. Well, that's that's cool that you're not jealous of Tulsa because <laughs> a lot of people might be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're fortunate. Business has been great. Right. So we're we're uh, we've got a really unique economy going on. And, and and frankly, a lot of people may not realize how how important manufacturing is to our our little world here, which is you know right up into the blue collar way of life. And so we're we're fortunate to be here and and excited about what what the future holds for all of us. Yeah, it's it it really is. It's a it's a lot of like I I always hear about your business mentioned in like the best of terms. It's obviously, with people on the East Coast, people out West wish they had a company like yours. Um, one of the things that I know is like, it's really important to you is this idea of like servant leadership. And I, the, what's interesting about that is I don't think I hear a lot of people talk about it in business circles. So I'm, I'm really curious to dive in. Let's maybe start with like, if, when you talk about servant leadership, if someone's never heard that word before, if they don't know what that means. What do you mean when you talk about servant leadership? You know, so a lot of times we'll talk to our, our people and, you know, are you a boss or are you a leader? And and about a servant leadership for me is is really putting yourself um, out front and to make sure that, you know, so I, I tell everybody my job is to take care of my people. And do you really rally behind it? Do you really, is it something that you want to do? And I think people can really tell, are you a boss or are you a leader? Um, are you constantly mm -hmm. thinking about um, their best, you know, their best interest? Are are you willing to lose um, a good team member because they have a phenomenal opportunity to go along? And so for for us, it's always about, hey, you know, it's the golden rule. Quite frankly, is you know, are you treating your folks on your team um, as good or better than than you would treat, you know? you're somebody else. And I heard the story or the statement the other day. He says, oh, we, he goes, Drew, I live by the platinum rule. And I said, what's the platinum rule? And I said, would I want this person to date my child or be their teacher? And if I wouldn't, then I probably don't want that person around. And so, well, or would I do something to that person if it was my child? So we all know a golden rule, platinum rule, 
you know, servant leadership, but certainly for me is if I can enrich the lives of my people, you know, that's generally the way we, we talk about it here at ProSource. My job is to take care of our people. Our people take care of our customers. Our customers will take care of all of us. But if I focus all my efforts on being the, the best steward of this business, um, then, then I know that we'll continue to attract the right folks and, and they'll be empowered to take care of our customers. It's easier said than done. Um, yeah, I was going to say, like, I feel like a lot of people, especially in the blue collar trades, uh, maybe had uh, really crappy bosses previously, like uh, either like just didn't know the business had really poor social skills. Like they probably had a lot of like deficiencies, which contributed to a lot of these people like going out to starting their own business and then recreating those habits. Do you feel like when you display your model of leadership that that people are surprised by how you approach it because it's probably different i would imagine for a lot of the people you hire for a lot of the managers you hire and promote like do you do you feel like that it's that is a an abstract concept because for a lot of people they might not have developed their careers in organizations with that sort of mindset yeah you know honestly i have and i would say that even with a bad leader or a bad boss it's not I always say, hey, you you know, sometimes finding out what you shouldn't do as as good as anything else. So if you're not going into every situation learning like, hey, when I get into a leadership spot, I'm not going to do this, that or the other. Um, but the other thing I would say about servant leadership that people really struggle with and fail at is it doesn't mean that you're a pushover. It doesn't mean that you fail to have those tough conversations. It actually means that you have them first. So the the, mm. the story here is like, if I really care about you as a person and a leader, um, then I need to address bad behavior right away. And because I need to give you the chance to be better. And so most people, that's where we fail. And and listen, right, we're all that way. I, I don't like to have tough conversations and nobody likes to. Yeah. But normally that's the kind of differentiating factors I find that people are like, um, their their bosses or leaders will ignore them or they won't address it or they go from zero to really angry really quick. And I can tell you how many times I've sat down with people and they thought I was going to fire them. And I'm like, I'm not firing you. We're coaching. I want you to be better. I want you and your family to to continue to succeed, but you're not meeting expectations. And I'm going to tell you that 99 times out of 100, people want to do the right thing. People want to perform. And a lot of times they just don't know what that looks like. How do you, so what, what's interesting about the way you're talking about it, like it's easy, I think, to, to manage, manage or imagine this on like a small scale, like you versus like five or six people that you're kind of having these daily huddles with. At a company the size of ProSource, like you're obviously going to have management layers in the middle. How, how do you work about building an organization where there are teams and management layers that also support these sort of ideals. Cause you can't do this on your own. Like this sort of value of the servant leadership needs to be uh, permeated throughout the organization. So how do you do that at scale beyond just your capacity? Does this go into like the way you hire? Does this go into like cultural things that you train as you, as people are a part of the organization longer, they kind of absorb these attributes. Like how does that work for you when you're trying to build your teams? Yeah, so I, th I would certainly think it's all of that. I mean, I think when you first come into the organization, it's all about setting the expectations. Um, so for me and my direct leaders, I realized that a lot of them maybe hadn't been trained this way. So I spent a lot of my time and effort saying, hey, here's how we're going to treat our folks. Here's how we're going to we're going to interact with our folks and helping them get there. But then you follow up with them and you hold them the expectations. So so that's part of it. You know, I think you certainly hire you know, we don't do enough character-based hiring in this industry or in this world is, you know, we've, we're trying to get much better about saying, hey, what do you stand for? Who do you want to be? Where do you want to grow up? Versus, mm -hmm. you know, hey, can you fog a mirror? Which I think we all, you know, kind of during COVID were in the fog the mirror part for a little bit. Um, but as much as anything is, I also use a lot of my time. I'm probably spending 25% of my time, you know, in the field in talking to our people or really? doing town halls and 
and I'm I'm the guy that when I do a town hall with our people, we don't let the the leadership there, right? This is between me and and the workers, and I lay out my expectations. So if they're not receiving that from their bosses, their their obligation is to to vocalize that, and then I can go. When you have a large organization, you know, hopefully you're by and large all moving in the same direction. But but the reality of it is, is you're always going to have some people that get into spots where they shouldn't be. Um, and I would tell you that from my perspective, what I've found is that when you realize those and you address them and you move on, your people will give you a pass. It's when you don't address it, hmm. you know, and a lot of times, again, my job is to make my team better. And so the first thing we always, we I always look in the mirror and say, what could I have done different to make this person successful? You know, so if everything starts with you of saying, okay, did I do what I said I was going to do? Did I educate the way I said I was going to? And if I didn't, then the onus is on me to get there. And that's the same approach we take yeah. when we terminate people. Do, do you ever feel like sometimes, uh, sometimes those decisions to either terminate or coach or promote anything like that, that sometimes your your timeline on making those decisions or making those moves is slowed down because of your approach. And I guess like by contrast, I know a lot of organizations, um, I've got a friend who works for Tesla. They are hyper fast on making hire, fire, promote decisions. Like you can go in for lunch and be gone in five minutes. Like they just ax, you're gone, right. peace out. Uh, and there's, there's probably people who criticize that sort of like really fast decision window. Uh, and for Tesla's culture, it makes sense. Do you ever feel like maybe you have the adverse side of that equation where because you're always willing to coach, you're always willing to kind of work with people, you're always willing to kind of help them and support them and enrich them, that maybe it slows down where you feel like we need to make this decision, but maybe you want to give the person another shot, another chance, you see them really trying, and like the soft side of you inhibits the hard tactical decision side of you. Like, does that ever become a tension for you to manage. Yeah. And I would say that it's certainly something that I struggle with internally, making sure that we don't, because you can't slow, you can't slow the whole process down. I would say initially when we roll these concepts out, yes, it is much slower. Um, the theory is, is as we all start doing the same thing, those coaching and teaching is going on on a daily basis. So when the moment comes to that, we're going to terminate somebody, um, generally, we can say we've done this, 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 and this. So you get much quicker. Now, I would always say that there are those, to me, non-negotiables, right? Mm -hmm. So there are non-negotiables to me that that you'll be terminated on the spot. And usually that's a lack of character or morals or, you know, theft. Yeah, probably something lines. legal. Yeah, yeah, something legal, right. something more ethical. Yeah, yeah. But you know how many times that I've come across folks where, um, and a lot of times I sit with my managers and we say, are they, you know, right person, right spot? Are they promotable or are they on the bubble? And and my whole job for them is if they're on the bubble, you need to move them off. Either they need to leave the organization or you need to move them up into a coaching spot. I'm going to tell you, I can't tell you how many times in my career it's because their manager or their leader didn't ex give them the express expectations for the job or mm. They just had a, an inability to connect with their manager, and we by by changing roles, they become a superstar. So generally, I always look back and say, "Why'd you hire this person? You saw mm -hmm. something in them." Now, you know, yeah. So it does slow you down, but the hope would be that instead of you know, if you can reduce your your turnover by twenty five percent, you become you know we've all. We've all talked about what's the cost of hiring and firing. Oh, yeah. and there's all these arguments yeah, yeah. out there, but you know it's a it's an astronomical amount of money. Well, now you just have to hire less, right? So your turnover slows down. I'm not a fan. I know a lot of companies out there they fire the bottom ten percent every year. Um, and and again, if people aren't doing what we expect them to do, yes, absolutely, they need to leave the organization. But by and large. Um, I think that we as employers, especially in the world that we live in today, right? You talk about this is the blue collar. You know, we don't have people coming into our industry. They're not flocking yeah. going, man, I really want to sell toilets or I want to be a plumber. Yeah. I want to be an electrician. Yeah. So as we get people into the industry, we need to really go all in on them to devote ourselves to them, to really hope that they can turn into that next generation. They're not all going to. 
but we can't we can't say oh well you know 25 percent of you are going to be gone in in a year from now so i'm not going to put any effort in right yeah, the thing that i like about what you're saying is like you're putting the onus on leadership to develop the people right because i feel like a lot of i'm going to use the word managers or bosses uh they kind of fall into this trap of expecting their hires or their employees to be perfect like they want the perfect tech they're the perfect salesperson they want all these people and they don't want to put the time work energy care into developing their team uh they they just don't they kind of want to like push button get talent and and then it's easy for those people to make excuses of why their team doesn't perform why they don't wear the right uniforms like why they like whatever right it's like it's my guys if i had your team i would be a good company too but what you're saying is like the exact opposite it's like no you're putting it on your shoulders to embody and live out those values and those practices and you said something too you you mentioned right people right seats are you are you guys eos that's a eos sort of framework uh nope no we're not oh you're not yeah so for those who aren't aware we've we've had a couple of eos people on the show before but eos stands for entrepreneurial operating system and the idea is uh you have the seats on the bus like these are the roles that need to be performed and you can talk about those roles all day long but then you have the people and then the people need to be in the right seat. And if they're not in the right seat, like there's no bad feelings. It's just, that's going to be difficult. Like you're going to have lackluster results. You're going to poor engagement and poor morale, whatever. And so when you could find ways to put the right people in the right seats, that's when you have this like magic happen. And like, you're kind of doing that on your own, right? Of saying, Hey, this person, are they the right person in the right seat? Or do we need to promote them? Do we need to coach them somewhere else? Do we move in your word was like, move them off the bubble. Like, can we do something to make them more in the right seat? And when those things happen, even if the right seat is outside the organization, everybody's happier for it. Everybody. You're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, how many times in our careers have we promoted one role to another role and they just didn't get it? Yeah. And, well, now they're out of the organization. And and I like to take the, well, well, well we promoted them. So... You know, let's maybe talk to them about taking a step back and going back to where they, they were happiest, they were good, they were, you know, beneficial for the company. E ego is a huge part of everything we do, right? So you, you always have to worry, massage through the egos. Um, did I just lose you? Okay, there we go. Um, no, we always have to massage fine. through the egos. But, um, but the reality of it is, is you also set the wrong precedent in the company of, oh my gosh, I don't want to take that next role because if I don't, if I fail, they're going to fire me. So, yeah. and we say, Hey, you know, just because that rule doesn't work out, doesn't mean that, that we need to get rid of you. Right. It's unless mm -hmm. again, you have, you, you fail because of a moral or ethical issue. Um, but you're right. The ownership's on me. And if I, if, if the culture of the organization is not right, it's my fault. If I have a rash of turnovers, it's my fault. And so I challenge everybody, hey, when you have people that quit, find out why. And yeah. generally, that's going to tell you where your problems are. So I have quarterly board meetings. And the first thing we always talk about safety. Second thing we always talk about is turnover. So, and I did that on purpose because I wanted to make sure that I was held accountable to reporting up our performance. Mm. And you generally know where the problems are. The people will tell you obviously because that's where you you experience the most turnover but but yeah it's it's my responsibility to set the right tone and it's my responsibility to put the right people in the leadership roles to to steward the business right so yeah there's there's an expression uh, like our director of operations says this all the time because i think i think people always use the like the saying like shit rolls downhill and his uh he's he's so thoughtful but his his background says no 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 if you're a good leader shit rolls uphill and you, but it's way of saying like if someone doesn't work out if they can't succeed or whatever it's your fault if it's a bad hire like it's it's the role of leadership's fault to kind of carry that weight um and it's so easy it's so easy to blame other people and it really is uh it really speaks volumes of of the way you approach your leadership mindset to put that on you first and foremost uh because there's a lot of like, self-reflection there right well i always tell my leaders if you ever really want to screw up my weekend text me at four o'clock and say hey can we talk on monday 
Because oh. I'm I, you just screwed up my whole weekend because I'm thinking, what's wrong? What you know, you're leaving. And and my wife, you know, I generally won't I will say we're meeting for coffee tomorrow. I don't care where you're at. I'm gonna come to you. Um, and now I have some that'll do that just to mess with me because you know they're mean to me like that sometimes. But but you're right. I mean, it's listen, I think you can't have the 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 role of everybody says it's always fun to be the man to hear the man. It, nobody wants to be in that top spot. Um if you're going to be that top spot, you've got to take the good and the bad. And and you can't take all the pos- positives and the pay or some of the other stuff without saying, you know, the culture's crappy. Well, that's my HR person. Then this person's no good because I, well, who's allowing that ex- to be there? Right. right. So, um, but you're right. There's an ownership that goes around. And, but I, I would say you go find the right people and the leadership job gets so much easier, so much more, more rewarding. Um, and it just becomes a lot more fun because my biggest challenge sometimes is keeping enough of my leaders plates full with opportunities. Um, mm. so I don't lose them or, and so it's part of, you know, part of that is that we got to keep growing. we got to keep doing these things because I got to keep filling their cup because yeah. they're just rocking and rolling. And, and that's the type of person they are. So that's the thing with like high quality people is they always want to challenge. Like right. they don't like to be stable. They don't like to settle for status quo. They're always hungry for doing better, uh, like getting more accomplished. Like their ego, it's not a negative statement. Their ego are powerful forces that keep high quality people engaged. I, I've, you know, it's funny. I had a conversation several years ago is uh, ego is not a bad thing. You know, right. e- if you let it get out of, out of control, but you know, I tell people a lot of times what keeps us from quitting when times get tough is our ego. I'm not mm-hmm. a quitter. So ego is a great thing if you manage it and you're right. Those, those folks are the ones. And so it goes back to that, you know, those high performers, they want to do more. They want to grow. They want to, they want to know where they need to be better. And generally those are the ones we don't jump on when they fail because they do all these other things. Great. Yeah, yeah. Right. And they're saying, no, no, tell me where I've messed up. And so, you know, and it's a Jim Collins book, but it's normally it's, hey, we're not I'm not talking to you about your poor performance. And I I, I give myself the excuse of, well, because he does all these wonderful things. In the reality, it's because I don't want to go have the tough conversation. And yeah. that person wants to know it. And um, and normally when you have it, it's a big relief and they feel it. Yeah. And so you become that again, you want to have a toxic environment, just stop avoiding conflict. Yeah. So uh, and- I could not agree more. I mean, you, you mentioned Jim Collins, but you're also talking about like, uh, there's a book called crucial conversations, which talks about like how to engage those when the stakes are high. And another one that comes to mind is uh, Patrick Lencioni. He has a framework or what does he call it? Uh, hungry, humble, smart. Yeah. Like when you create healthy conflict, like he calls it healthy conflict and you look for people who are hungry, healthy, smart, like there is no, like uh, Lencioni would say, there's no industry that no company could dominate under any conditions if you have the right people doing those things. And it was like, totally makes sense, right? You're yeah. fostering this great teamwork. Well, and you, how do you want to be treated? How do you want your kid to be treated? How do you want, you all want a fair stake, right? And and that good to great is where the, the different mm-hmm. people on the bus came to be. And it was just an epiphany of like, you know, and so we tell, now, to do that, you have to run a very strict business. You have to hold people accountable. You can't allow, how many times have you heard in your career as well? It's just a warm body. No, yeah, right. screw that, right? I can't, I, no, because I want to be in the position when a rock star comes on the market that I bring them onto my team. Right. And then, and, and people struggle with that sometimes of where, do, where what are they going to do? I haven't figured it out yet. It's just, I know I want to, they make us better. And those when you get we've done some hires like that too. It's crazy it's amazing, because like right? when you, when you find the right people, you're like, I don't know the job description yet. You're the right person. We'll figure it out the other stuff. But like they absolutely are next level players every time. Yep, every time. You've got to break down the fiefdoms, and a lot of times I laugh and I sometimes say, the more people make, the harder they are to manage. Um, but you know, one of the things that I try to do relatively frequently. Is, is massage responsibilities in between groups because um, there's a lot of what we do that has crossover, you know, and mm-hmm. so you can have, you know, marketing that goes to different departments. And so um, every now and again, I'll flop those around because more than anything, I need to break down the fiefdoms. And we say, listen, right. it's not your person. This is our, our company. 
And your job as an executive member of the team is to go do the right thing for the company, even if it's the wrong thing for your group. And when people really embrace that, man, it gets in. And, and listen, I say all these things. We have so many daily challenges and we beat our head against the wall. And I often tell people, I really hope a brain surgeon doesn't have nearly these challenges because, oh my gosh, I'd really worry about them. But dealing with people is single handedly the biggest challenge and the greatest reward. Um, yeah. And it's almost like you, parenting in that, in that regard, right? Like, yeah, it is. Parenting sucks. Also, it's amazing. It, it is. And, when they want to bring their kids into the organization, you know, or they yeah. want to, you know, or you get a, you get a note. We just got a note because when somebody has a baby, um, we send them this real big gift basket full of all this stuff that people normally don't buy and you think of. And, and when, when they say, man, I'm so proud to be part of this family. And, you know, th that's why you do it. Yeah. Right. That's, that's why, that's what makes you get up and want to go fight the fight. And um, yeah, we sell plumbing and electrical and lighting and hardware. But the reality of it is, is we're service solution providers. And, you know, when we do what we do well, other businesses are operating very well. Right. So, yeah, um, you know, it makes it fun. If somebody's listening to you talk and maybe they're intrigued by the idea of servant leadership or even just how you think about things in general, are there are there a couple of tips or a couple of resources you can point to them? Like any you mentioned good to great. Uh, or are there any other resources or books or reading material that you would recommend somebody reading and absorbing and thinking about to start thinking this way that has been obviously so successful for your business and your career? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm obviously you'll find it real quick by my titles, so, you know, the good to great or who moved my cheese, right. Were the two mm -hmm. probably ones that, that transformed me as I was a young manager. Um, but I would tell you that if people really want good feedback, go find people in their organization that they have a really good relationship with and challenge them to give them positive feedback or give them feedback, good or bad. So the best thing that I ever did was I did a 360 review. And so mm -hmm. my real quick story is I knew I was a micromanager at the time. That's just my personality, but I thought I played it off well enough that nobody knows. So I get this 360 review back and it was like, man, we love working for the guy. If he would just leave us alone and let us do our jobs, we'd love him even more. And so your people, you, you, you're not that good of an actor. Your people feel it. Um, if you give them a, I remember um, back in 08, you know, the world's imploding. And I had a, a, a young uh, inside salesperson come into my office and she said, hey, I'm going to tell you something and uh, you're probably going to fire me. And I said, okay, what's that? She goes, you're a real jerk. She goes, you know, you're not fun anymore. You're not exciting. You're not engaging. You've really turned into a real jerk. And, you know, I looked at her and I said, Kelly, you're right. Yeah, I'm, I'm letting this pressure get to me. I can't control. And that really forced me to, but had she not felt empowered to come tell me these things, I would have continued down that path. So, yes, we can read books. And I would always say um, every book just take, you know, I always take a little you know, whether it's even the topic or it's even the point of the book, you just write these notes down that resonate with you. But finding and surrounding yourself with people that will be honest with you and yeah, well, not be afraid of your title or your role and feel safe enough to come challenge you. Because if one person feels it, everybody feels it. Right. Well, so, yeah. Well, Drew, I am. Uh... Yeah, I'm really impressed by the way you think about leadership and building your teams and the values you're instilling through your organization. If somebody wants to reach out to you personally and like pick your brain, is there a way that people could hit you up? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to share my my cell phone or, or uh, email. And, you know, my cell is 602-708-3680. And my email is drew.roberts at prosourcesupply.com. And I, you know, I think that there's probably one of the best things that could ever happen is when people reach out and say, can you give me some advice? Because I do the same. We all have mentors. We all have people that we lean on. And quite frankly, I've screwed up about as many things as possible. If I can keep one person from making the same mistake, man, we all, we all win from that. And I generally will take as much as I give. So always welcome any kind of interactions.
Dude, that's awesome. I'll make sure that your information is in the show notes. I'll also put a couple of the books that you mentioned, the, the Good to Great, Who Moved My Cheese is a great book for like someone doing change management in an organization. So I'll put I'll put those in there. Drew, I know you're crazy busy. Congratulations on all the success with ProSource. Uh, it was awesome having you on. Good conversation, man. Hey, Ryan, thank you very much. I appreciate the invite and best of luck to everybody. Best of luck to you. This episode was hosted by Ryan Redding, author of the book on digital marketing for plumbing and HVAC contractors and founder of Leveragey, the digital marketing solution for serious home service companies. You can subscribe to Blue Collar CEO on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Visit us online at bluecollar.ceo and find us on Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week with another awesome episode. See you soon.